um, to show you. Okay, but the, I need to share the screen. Share screen, share. Um, what do I share now? Okay. Do I share? Okay. I'm not sure now. Do I share these statistics? It's yeah. fine. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because it came automatically since I tried before, so I got a little confused. Okay, so we had actually six six hundred eighty nine registered participants, and four hundred forty eight members that were registered on Slack. And I, this is just looking at me um, about uh, looking at the website. We had during the first week about every day more than 100 people during the first week attending the talks. And then during the second and third week, there were also always about in the order of 50 people attending the talks that orga were organized by individual groups. So here shows kind of how our participation was nationwide. Um, this is... Um, the users as, as they actively participated, we have the greatest participation from the US. But look, second participation from Turkey, Germany was active, India and Switzerland, of course, Italy and Netherlands were the most active ones. Um, here's the use that shows kind of the web use, how people used our website. Clearly, most use was made of the schedule, uh, but live stream was actively used here on um, number three. Um, topic areas were clearly active and um, we had to communicate, uh, they had to communicate. And here below you see the individual groups, uh, all about the same. So we had a good participation, good outcome in all groups, which is very positive for us. This is some Slack statistics. There were more than 13,000 messages sent around. So you guys communicated very well. And this shows the use during the week. So clearly we had most use usage made in the first week when there were the general talks, but then even during the second third week, we had great participation. And among the 644 responses at this time, people were asked which category they fall into. We have lots of misters. 13 point, I saw more than 50%, 13.5 misses, so that's mostly graduate students. And then the participation of professors, 9%. And doctors also in the order of 25%. So this is our senior personnel, and this is our active, these are our active students. Um, here you see some participation. Most of it, 82%, still come, come from academia, but also a nice industry participation, government labs, and then individuals, others. Um, this again refers, we have seen similar things before, student versus senior personnel. So students were about 53, not about, exactly 53.6%, and faculty 15.6%, and postdocs. And we also have technical staff and the others we didn't identify. And uh, yes, we had people on there working with big time differences. The whole world was participating. <laughs> so uh, here just shows the time differences between, I mean, we know Europe, we had Australia on, we obviously had the US on. Okay, and finally, some background on the participants. We have participation from computer science, dominating engineering, machine learning, it's getting more and more neuromorphic engineering. But also lots, 
people that identified themselves as the core discipline being neuroscience, biology and life sciences, um, also cognitive and behavioral sciences, and a few social, social sciences and ethics. So this concludes our statistics. And um, uh, what I want to mention also that we are putting up now, um, coming back to the very first day, you know, we are funded by NSF and we are just in the process of putting up the website and we'll by the end of the year also start the scholarship program. And it's, it is expected that the first participants in this scholarship program, which means traveling for a half a year to another lab, for interdisciplinary activity will come out of these activities. Okay, so with this, I'm handing over. There to the presentations. To Guido, right? Or Guido, do you want to say a few words about the sponsors of the workshop? Yeah, I just wanted, yeah, exactly. I, I no. um, wanted to echo Cornelia's sentiment that this was a really uh, impressive workshop this year. So thank you everyone who helped make it a success. It was really rewarding to see the amount of collaboration and communication and effort that went into the projects in addition to obviously a, a great set of talks. I know um, we saw, as, as Cornelia mentioned, you know, 50 to over 100 people in, in the Zoom. And as we also know, the, the live stream was very um, well used. So it was really nice to see kind of that we were able to extend ourselves out to um, time zones around the world. So thank you everyone for your dedication and commitment to making this a success and for your, um, you know, the generosity of your, um, your, your time and your expertise. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders um, as we start to move into the presentations in, in a moment. Um, just a reminder to everyone who either participated or, or is listening that this is all unpublished work and so that the rights to Publish this kind of state uh, definitely stays with the authors, and so um, just kind of reminding everyone of what we talked about on the first day, which is to be respectful of the fact that this is kind of a this is a workshop environment where you're seeing a sneak preview into a lot of really interesting and exciting work that is going to continue past the horizon of the workshop. Please be respectful of that. Um, and then, of course, this workshop is not possible without the support of. The NSF and our uh, our corporate sponsors as well. And this year, um, we had a fantastic support from Sony, uh, Sony AI, and um, we're gonna ask them to talk to us very briefly for um, uh, the the next time slot is gonna be someone from Sony. Actually, I don't know who decided yes, to. That would be me. Okay, excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like to take over and yes. uh, give us? a little um, a talk about your company. Yeah, thank you. So I'll share my screen. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Rafaela from the Sony AI office in Zurich. And I'm super excited that I could join this year's workshop. So I did my PhD at the Neuroinformatics Institute in Zurich. So I already heard a lot about Telluride. And I'm excited or happy that I could um, listen to this year's lectures and then also to see the results of the demos later on. So um, I joined Sony in March this year. And since Sony AI is a sponsor of Telluride, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about what we are doing at Sony AI. So Sony AI was uh, founded last year in March and we currently have three office locations one in Tokyo, another one in Zurich, and we are also in the US. So we have a clear mission that is to unleash human imagination and creativity with artificial intelligence. So you probably know Sony for its entertainment and sensing. So we have really good cameras and audio, and we also have the PlayStation. And now here at Sony AI, we research and um, develop AI further um, to empower the imagination and creativity of artists, makers, and creators around the world. So while we do so, we want that our AI always works in, in harmony with the people, 
and we want to augment human capabilities, but never replace humans, so to lead to greater efficiency. So we always follow our values that are diversity, transparency, and social good. And we know that extraordinary innovation requires a diversity in people, uh, in people and methods. So AI should always be developed in a responsible, fair, and transparent way. And all our technologies should always serve the social good. So Sony AI follows a grand challenge approach to tackle questions of AI. So we have three main flagship projects that want to tackle some problems. And all these three projects are always well aligned with our AI ethics group that makes sure that we act according to our values. So one of these projects is an imaging and sensing. And here we want to take advantage of the knowledge uh, and the know-how of um, Sony as a sensor company. So we are working together with the relevant business units and the aim is to um, further incorporate AI into the sensors. Then another project is in gaming. So here we are working together with PlayStation to create a richer gaming experiences. And another project is in the field of gastronomy. So we see a lot of potential in the field of gastronomy to incorporate artificial intelligence here, because gastronomy can actually be regarded as a field of entertainment and creativity, because it requires imagination as well as execution, and it also stimulates all our senses. So now I want to tell you a little bit about this Sony AI gastronomy project. Um, so as I said, gastronomy can be regarded as a creative entertainment business that creates um, creators that connects creators and consumers. And we want to help creators to improve the experiences of the consumers in two different fields. So one would be in an AI-powered recipe creation app, and another would be um, in the chef assisting cooking robots. So for the recipe creation, we want to achieve a pairing app that helps chefs to develop um, new flavors and dishes. So by um, combining different ingredients and creating some aromatic synergies to create some new flavors. And it can also be used um, to get the most nutritional benefit out of pairing some ingredients. So this is one on one hand challenging for AI, because there are infinite possibilities and lots of data. And there are also many constraints what should not be paired, for example. And um, then there's also a wealth of opportunity, however. So we want to help chefs in their creative process to develop new dishes and do this by alleviating health issues and also tackle food sustainability. Um, the second project is about a chef assisting cooking robot. So here we have the vision that a robot could tackle complex and time intensive processes in the kitchen that range from preparation to plating. So we also see the range of capabilities here, for example, in ingredient, oops, ingredient recognition and high precision execution and remote operation. And many use cases are from preparation to cooking, like heating specific ingredients for some amount of time at the same temperature and also plating. And so overall, by incorporating AI into gastronomy, we want to help people create delicious, healthy and sustainable um, dishes. So some news. Uh, we have currently launched a collaboration with the Michelin winning chef, Hajime Yoneda. And you can find out more about him on this link. And he created this beautiful dish that you can see here on the left image. And this shows us that we can fuse together art, science, and engineering. And this is just one of the collaborations um, that we currently have. But you can find out more about the others and also about the other projects and our news in general on our blog. So now um, you might ask yourself what we are looking for at a neuromorphic engineering workshop. <laughs> so um, all our projects require the interaction with the environment. And we know that 
Um, low power and low latency is very important here. Um, real world interaction is actually already performed in many some many of Sony's products. Also, we have these edge cases like the Sony's um, uh, AirPeak drone, and here you can see a picture of the Vision S project where uh, AI was incorporated for safety, adaptability, and um, entertainment in, in an autonomous car. And maybe you also know that Sony actually has a long history uh, with this social robotic dog here, I, which is called Ivo. So at Sony AI, we want to bring AI closer to the sensors and now only compute when and where it is really needed. So as you know, neuromorphic computing is promising in low power and low latency real world applications. And um, we want to integrate AI into Sony's products to support the next generation of robots, cars and appliances. So at, in this, Grand challenge approach that we have will require actually novel hardware and new algorithms. And we're moving to computation at the edge. So at the same time, we are also concerned about the sustainability and privacy and local processing becomes also very important for us. So to achieve these goals, we are exploring neuromorphic hardware as well as novel learning and control algorithms that realize low power and low latency and distributed AI in the real world environment. And we definitely found some inspiration here, I tell you right. So finally, um, if you're excited about our mission as I am and you agree with our values, we invite you to submit your application to us. We, are, we have some um, job openings in the field of computer vision reinforcement learning and robotics, and also in AI ethics. So you can find more about the openings on our link here. So now, thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take some questions. Cool. I have a question. I'll just ask a question right now. If I was a PhD student, how could, could uh, I also do part of my PhD project with Sony? And would I be able to publish the results? How, how, what's the relation between doing PhDs or masters and Sony and working with Sony in um, uh, one of the research centers? So there are actually some intern, internship positions together with, with master students um, doing internships at Sony. I think that, so to my knowledge, there's also the possibility to do a PhD, but I don't know any one person who's actually doing this. So, I'm not entirely sure. Okay, thank you. I have a question yeah. to uh, yeah. uh, Toby, this Andreas. Yeah. Um, so hypothetically, hypothetically, uh, can Sony propose a grand challenge that we can have a group at um, Telluride work on? And again, if any results come out, this would be something that all will publish or something like that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure this is possible. Not 100%, but uh, since Sony AI is already collaborating with universities, I'm, I'm kind of sure. But I think this would be nice to have something for Telluride, you know? Just so yeah. they solve this problem and we can have a group of five, 10 people work hard on it. And at the end, we write a paper. Yeah, and that would something. be really cool. Actually. I mean, Guido, that would be something that would be welcome, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. especially, I mean, I, one thing I really like, and thank you for this presentation. One thing that jumped out is um, that Sony kind of shares the commitment to creative applications of AI um, and uh, uh, diverse approaches um, that kind of all still fall in line with the, the ethical um, yeah. standards of development of AI. And so I think that's one thing that really stands out about our community as well as that we've got a, a very diverse set of um, people from around the world with different yeah. ideas and, and um, skill sets. And so it'd be really interesting to think about, you know, when we when we have olfaction groups, how does that play into uh, AI gastronomy and, th and things of that nature mm -hmm. so um it's a very cool presentation I, I appreciate your support and i want to remind everyone 
that it's exactly this type of collaboration um, with industry that also pays for students to come to Telluride um, as scholarships next year. And so um, we hope that we can continue this partnership and find explicit project works uh, where yeah. we can where we can team up and, and do cool things together. Um, so I look forward to welcoming everyone to Colorado next year. I guess what I'm yeah. saying. We any other questions from um, from any of the any participants to Sony? This is a chance to ask direct. I have a question. So, uh, this is wonderful uh, uh, to see uh, Sony's uh, Sony AI's engagement in the Norfolk community. So, so in addition to uh, supporting us and, and encouraging us to do great uh, research, um, would Sony also be interested in uh, lending some of your great uh, hardware or, or latest advances that you have for us to play with? Um, that I'm also not entirely sure about how are the regulations. For instance, your are. lidar sensors, or I mean, there's all these different types of uh, interesting sensors or, or systems that that we can experiment with. Yeah, but I I would believe that if we go to tell you right that we could bring our hardware as well and to play. That would with. be fantastic. That would be really really cool to create a project with specialized yeah. hardware and people coming to really working with us, you know? Yeah, I think we could discuss that for next year. Wonderful, thanks. Then maybe we, yeah. I do have some data sets that I've created with some of Sony's uh, neuromorphic sense, uh, event-driven sensors uh, already. So I'm happy to share those with anyone who is interested in exploring some of the, the HD um, uh, devices outputs, so yeah. In All fact, right. Sony AI and Prophecy had this wonderful uh, DVS sensor they presented a few years ago at the mm -hmm. ICCC. Yeah. Yeah. Sony is the world's leading image sensor company. Uh, you know, there's other really good ones like Omnivision, Samsung, and so on. But Sony always leads the pack in terms of technology development. In fact, they were the first ones to bring out these stack sensors where you stack a high-speed digital die behind the, the uh, image sensor die. And they're the first ones to try to roll out a, a small uh, accelerator within that, that die. Way there, be, be, it'd be cool to try some of those things. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, that's just to speak about one particular aspect. Um, so big thanks to Sony. It'll help pay our housing bill in Telluride, which is expected to be extremely substantial if we stay in Telluride next year. That's still yeah. open for debate. And um, I also want to give a big thanks. Do you mind if I give a thanks to NSF here, Guido? Yeah, please do. Uh, yeah, so let me just share here. I want to give a thanks also, explicit thanks to the people from NSF who participated um, in the first day. Xu Xiang has supported us now for years. Uh, Claire Hemingway and especially Grace, Grace Huang, who participated in multiple talks and discussions during the workshop. It was nice to see you guys there. Um, and uh, there's one more thing I need to say about to all the workshop participants. It, it echoes also what um, Guido was talking about, you know, if you start something in Telluride, the best outcome and the real aim of a workshop like Telluride is that you get a joint publication. My favorite one is this human versus computer slot car racing project that we did uh, maybe about seven or eight years ago. You see the author list is from all over the world and all these people were participating in Telluride and all you need to do to thank the workshop and give credit to the workshop, and it's really good for the workshop, is to put in your acknowledgments that the work was supported by the Telluride workshop. And you did some of the initial preparatory work at the workshop. And that's highly appreciated uh, by us workshop organizers and the NSF, because it allows us to find those papers in Google Scholar Hits and get statistics about how influential the workshop is. So I guess that concludes this uh, introductory part of the workshop. And now we're gonna begin with the topic areas in the order which is shown um, on our schedule. I don't know if somebody can show the schedule easily, um, but the order is listed on the schedule page of the workshop. And it is, I have to look at it myself. Um, we're gonna start with, um, yeah, tactile perception. So the, and now we're gonna, and now the rules are very clear. I'm very tough about this. Each topic area gets 15 minutes to present the results, and then we'll have five minutes to actually ask questions and clarify some of the things that are of interest to people. 
So Kiara and Elisa, your, the floor is yours. And then we're gonna take a break after the first two topic areas, um, just like at 21, casino dealer, and then we'll have the last three topic areas. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Toby. I won't say much about the topic because I want to give space to the people who really worked on the work groups. What I want to say is that I'm really happy about uh, seeing a lot of people involved in running the projects and supervising the projects, especially Friedemann and Elisabetta and Elisa um, were really helpful in uh, um, in making things happening, um, and of course, all the students. So I would leave the stage to uh, two presentations, one on the TAC Braille uh, letters recognition and one on the circuit design. Michele, do you want to take the start or should I do it? Yeah, you can start if you want. OK. And let me briefly share. Okie dokie. Don't start the time yet. Let me find the point. Okay. So now we can start. So happy to welcome you to the first of our presentation Friday uh, and last day of Telluride. So it was really great fun. And we have been working on gray letters. And if we are able to read them with tactile sensing devices. And for that, we had the luck to work on two different data sets, one provided from NUS, which was based on tapping on these 3D printed Braille letters. The other one from IIT, from the ICAP robot, which was uh, recorded by sliding over printed Braille letters. So two somehow similar, but also very different data sets. And for the NUS skin data set, the data was already event driven, but for the um, sliding, the ICAP data set, we gathered sample based sensor data and later on calculated in offline manner events following the Delta rule. And so our first idea was let's, let's have a look how a PCA will deal with, with our sliding data. And if we feed in all the raw sensor values, like as matrices, then we can see we have some, some clustering, but most of the letters are quite good distinguishable. And then we thought, how would it look like if we feed in our event-driven data? And for instance, we took a spike count because we had the idea maybe it's even sufficient to look at the amount of, of spikes coming out. And you can see it is not. So you get a very unclear clustering, which is not very helpful. So we thought maybe it will be a good idea to have a look at, at the event data. So maybe let me first go, go down here. Um, if we want to use our event data, which is spikes at very discrete points in time, if we want to use that for learning in Slayer or in, in SpyTorch, we need to use some kind of time binning. And for that, we look at a certain time period. And if there was a spike, we put a one. If not, we keep it as zero. So this is then how we transformed our events from the sliding data set uh, into time bins and fed this to a SVM. And what we can see is the accuracy is not, not worse, but also not very high. So with some, some talk back in the group and good input from Friedemann, we came up with using a, a Gaussian kernel to filter this kind of input in time, which means instead of having just zeros and one, we are able to smear it out a bit, which you can see on the, on the right. And that definitely helped the classifier to find, to be able to distinguish better between different letters. And we have done a lot of more, um, Ideas followed a lot of more ideas on different encoding and classification strategies, but I will not go any deeper in, on, on that for now, but let us come to spiking networks. So what 
or how do we decide which letter is chosen? So we have our input, which is fed into our spiking network, and we have our output neurons. And what we do is basically we look at the neuron with the highest amount of spiking activity, that one indicating us uh, which letter was presented. And what we figured out is that by using SpyTorch, that already after 100 epochs, we have quite good accuracy, still, still some loss, but quite good accuracy. As you can see, we are already quite at a plateau. And we, keep that, we kept it on going for another 900 epochs. And you can see the loss was really dropping a, a lot. So it's still a factor of one third. But the test accuracy would see wasn't that well. And our intuition is that we have been overfitting on, on this way by keep on learning. And then we, we looked at uh, another algorithm, another network structure, which is layer, which we have been running on the Luigi chip. And Slayer, how we implemented it is was a straightforward network. And we can see that the accuracy is not, not as good as the one we saw before. And it was getting slightly better when we insert delays, which somehow can be interpreted as some kind of, of in introducing also temporal dependencies here. And if, if we do that, maybe I should also mention this is on, on the slide, sliding data set. And if we do the same on the NUS data set, which is uh, a tapping strategy and can maybe seen as containing a, a bit less temporal, the, the information is less temporal encoded, but more spatially encoded, we can see that we get even better results, which was, oh, let me come to that point later on. So right here. So in the end, we can say that we have been figure or we have the guess that when, when we use our sliding data and use recurrent networks, we get better results than when we use it on the, uh, on the tapping one, which is more spatial distributed. And we would also argue here, it is definitely not a proof, it's just a guess or impression we got from the data we saw that when we use recurrence, we can also solve better temporal distributed data set as when we use simply feed, feed forward networks as we have been using also to, to get a feeling for, for that. Um, and maybe on the other hand, you could also say when we use feed forward networks just on the tapping and in that case layer, we have a better accuracy as on the sliding one, which might also underline the idea we have here. So there is still a lot of things you want to find out. And in the end, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but we came up with even more questions than we started with. And we are lucky about it because we want to be uh, working on going on working on that as group. And we hope to uncover a lot of new questions and find answers for them. Here are some of them, but I don't know how I am in time and I guess I will better end with just saying a very big thanks to the group it was an amazing time it was very nice to work with you together also special thanks to Chiara, Elisa and Friedemann for helping us a lot and also for Ruhan and Benjamin for helping us with the new data set and with that I would come to an end and take questions Just leave the questions until the end of the 15 minutes, okay, Simon? No, okay. Yeah, totally fine. Absolutely. Go ahead, go ahead with the next part. Um, hi. Uh, can I... Sh oh, yeah, sorry. I can. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Ella, and I'm going to present the um, tactile part. And I'm going to try to speak fast because we have a lot of stuff. So basically, let's go really fast over the motivation of why we want to do event-driven encoding for skin. Um, the, the thing is, if you consider the skin, there's a lot of receptors. And if we want to cover an electronic skin, um, we would have with 
standard methods, a high amount of data that we would have to process because we need to be able to have high um, sampling frequencies. And on the other hand, we are sampling from everywhere, even though we probably have only very localized touch. So that's why we want to do event-driven coding. But how do we uh, vision our architecture? Basically, we have a model provided by Benjamin T that is um, tactile piezo resistive um, sensors that we want to interface with the readout circuit um, that is spiking. And the, with the AER, we want to um, get the information to a neural uh, network, to spike a neural network that then gives us information about possible um, grasping um, patterns or whatever we want to recognize. So how do we want to do that? Um, you have all in the last couple of days heard um, about different uh, tactile encoding mechanisms. We have slowly and rapidly adapting um, afferents and more or less we can say very broadly that um, for slowly adapting afferents, they encode the intensity of the stimulus in the spiking frequency, while rapidly adaptive um, afferents to delta coding. So basically, they encode change with spikes. So that's what we were trying to do, basically saying, OK, we want to interface. Uh, we want to do slowly adaptive neurons um, by interfacing the current produced by the pizza resistive elements with leaky integrated fire neurons. And on the other hand, use a pixel circuit to do the rapidly adaptive ones. Um, <clears throat> so basically, we started with a very standard uh, readout to the um, piezo resistors, because the resistors have a very um, unfriendly um, behavior of resistance over pressure. So basically, they go very steeply um, in with a, uh, down with low pressures, and then uh, more or less attenuate at a fixed level for higher pressures. So what we did here was we um, fixed the sensor um, voltage and basically just looked at the uh, current. And on the right hand here, um, with the uh, on the right uh, upper right hand side, you can see how well behaved the current was then, uh, more or less linear. Um, however, on the other hand, you can also see that this goes along with very high uh, currents, and this is thus not really suitable for. Uh, low power applications. So what we did instead was uh, design another readout stage, which is a um, degenerate differential NMOS um, circuit, where we basically have the resistive model um, on the lower right hand side with the pressure of the pressure and we compare it to the um, resistance or the voltage produced by a resistance that is not changing. And um, we feed this to the source and the gate of a PMOS transistor and basically reduce the um, what's <laughs> the potentials um, that the resistance decreases and thus the um, necessary uh, current strongly. And you can also see that we only use four transistors, which are fairly small, which means we are also a lot more uh, area efficient. Now, if we uh, look at what this would mean for the current, we see that we also have a more or less linear fit for currents uh, for pressures of up to about uh, 75 kilopascal, and um, our per uh, current then attenuates uh, towards uh, 200 kilopascals. Um, so what we did with this um, direct interfacing uh, circuit was we fed it to uh, three different um, integrated fire neurons. Basically, we started with the very simple axon hillock, and we then wanted to compare it to um, a simplified DPI neuron. Um, why simplified? We left the current mirror on top of the first inverter um, out and um, thus have a higher um, current and power consumption, slightly higher, but um, 
we were using Skywater and mostly playing with it. And we somehow just needed it to work. Um, finally, we also uh, simulated it with a leaky integrated fire neuron, um, as you can see on the right. Now, um, here you can see the normal axon hillock um, circuit on the left. And you can also see that the interspike um, interval between spikes decreased with increasing um, pressure, which is something that we want to see because uh, it means on the other hand that uh, one over the easy uh, ISI um, would be the frequency. So we have increasing frequencies with increasing pressure. And we can see a similar behavior um, for the DPI. Um, so on the left, you can see um, basically the instantaneous uh, firing rate in uh, red um, over uh, different pressure levels. So in blue is the pressure, pressure levels. And um, you can see that they more or less increase linearly. You might wonder what this green part is. Um, well, you can see that there is a lot of noise basically. And on the right, you can see why that's happening. Um, the membrane potentials that were recorded for the different um, pressures were very um, inconsistent and not necessarily going all the way down. And this was due to um, the time step that we chose. Um, if, we cho uh, if we chose a larger time step, uh, a smaller time step, the um, simulation time increased exponentially and um, the data, like the amount of data we uh, got was also really huge. But the green part in the left figure basically shows that we can drastically reduce the um, noise and have a very uh, nice um, mean instantaneous uh, firing rate in response to the pressure. Um, with the leaky integrated fire neuron, we also see that we have an increase in um, the firing rate with increased pressure. And when we compare those um, three neurons, we can see that um, the axon hillock seems to be behaving the best uh, with the lowest power co uh, consumption and also the lowest size. But on the other hand, we have to consider that um, the DPI That's neuron and the LIF neuron have much more parameters that we didn't have the time to optimize. Um, finally, uh, we also played a bit with delta coding and implemented the um, DVS pixel circuit without the uh, lock amplifier and with a with an AER, and basically just compared it to um, a linear input because we haven't so far managed to um, linearize the resistor model uh, to a vo uh, linear voltage. But we hope to continue working on that. And I want to thank all my collaborators um, and our supervisors. And on the end, we finally want to also acknowledge uh, the New Touch um, project that uh, basically provided some funds for some of the people. Um, Yes, we're very open to questions. Please ask. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, I have to stop you now. Just exactly 15 minutes. Uh, now is the time for questions. We actually have a discussion of what's been presented. So I have a question then, uh, but I'd rather that somebody else ask a question who's in the audience. Please feel free to chime in. And by the way, somebody's microphone there is making noise in the background. So please mute yourself if you're not active, okay? Okay, Simon, can I ask you about what you were showing then? So basically you had one thing where you tap and what was the sensor that you were using? Were those piezoelectric sensors in both hand, in both uh, fingers that were touching it and how big were they? So for the uh, NUS data set, which is the tapping one, these have been piezoelectrics. But how um, many of the little, uh, little things are there that can sense this simplified braille characters? It's more or less, I mean, it's, it's one square centimeter and it has 80 sensors. 80, like so by, uh, what does that mean? 80? Um, one, 100 divided by 80, something like that, right? Yeah. One, but, one something. <laughs> but, is, but is that number that you get like 70% accuracy, is that good or bad? I mean, what can a human do? Well, that's I very good question. right? 
that that's a very good question and i mean we, we have been cheating a bit because if you look at the scale so for humans they are much smaller but on the other hand we have much more sensors so, so what so what so what? what can I, a human do humans are perfect human, right they are perfect like reading but but on that side i would also argue that we have trained a lot so i mean we are able a, a able to read words if the letters are completely messed up right just the first and the last has to be correct and we are still able to read it by eye and i guess for braille it's more or less the same these guys who are using braille they are really good in it and but so how they can fast are they it. reading how fast are experienced braille readers actually reading in in uh, letters per second that's a good question i can't answer I'm excited that it's not uh, up at 100% yet because that leaves some room for us to consider this as a benchmark um, for different ideas. Yeah, and it's a reference. Yeah. Yeah, so, me, uh, yeah uh, we are happy to, to leave some room for you guys. So humans have multiple fast. sensors, right? The different sizes, multiple corpuscles. Uh, but one question, why do you think um, that spikes or event-based would be better for a classification task than having the signal in. I, I would, um, on, on that, I would follow the line Eller started. Like the idea here is maybe, maybe it is not the best for classification, but it is good to have a uh, event-driven tactile sensor because you are not touching all the time. So it's like very energy efficient. And I mean, as long as the sensor is already event-driven, it would be good to, to stay in that domain. And, yeah. uh, and when humans read Braille, they, they rub over the characters. So you presume probably the timing and the vibration stuff like that is very important. And spike timing, you would presume, is, is useful for that, right? Absolutely. I totally very sensible. Yeah, I, I like that you had a list of questions that you still want to pursue. Some of them um, kind of resonated as things that I would want to ask at the end of this presentation. Things like, um, do we know what the uh, confusion matrices look like and how similar are the different um, uh, approaches in terms of the mistakes they make? Things like that. Oh, truly, I, I could have shown them. So it's like very, well, what you can see is that letters, which are looking also for by eye similar from the structure, these are the ones they are confused mostly. Cool, that's encouraging. And it, it kind of, um, there's probably interesting analyses to do in terms of how long it takes. Uh, you know, like one of the things that you get with an event-driven sensor is um, a continuous classification process and, you know, the, see how quick you can yeah. get to the right, things like that would be that, interesting. That, that's definitely an open question for us. When do we have to make the decision? So like we have, we have the constant stream of input data. If, if we assume we scan over multiple letters, then when is the time to decide? And that, that's very, really a tough question, I think, and a necessary question to solve for the future. Very impressive work. I really liked um, both, both of these thrusts I thought were really impactful, uh, really nice collaborations, kind of great examples of the, um, the types of things that we love to see at Telluride. So I wanna say thanks to the Tactile Sensing Group for such an awesome uh, 2021. Nice work, everyone. Okay, Thank so let's so go like, now to uh, the yeah, analog like neuromorphic to technology. Have, uh, yeah, humans oh, okay. can do Braille at about 200 words per minute, which is about like words almost the same minute. as reading. Yeah. Almost the same as reading. So 200 words per minute. So that's um, 200 words per 60 seconds. So that's like three words per second, roughly. So three times six words per second. Uh, letters per second, roughly. 18 hertz. Yeah, like 20 hertz, right? Thank That's you. definitely pretty fast. Pretty fast. Okay. Sounds like a good challenge for you guys. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Terry, take over, I guess, or uh, Jen. Jen, take over. Yeah, sounds good. I will uh, take a stab at this. Um, all right, so what's been happening with the Analog Neuromorphic Tools and Technologies group? Um, the majority of what we've done for the last three weeks has most has been about um, sharing about these tools, learning about these tools, um, learning FPA programming tools, um, learning how to access Braindrop, uh, playing with these things with remote access. Um, 
So most of what we have accomplished is more about teaching and about tutorials. Um, and then there's also been a very big chunk of discussion and planning for this chip design uh, project um, that we'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, the, our goals for this three weeks were to get people exposed to the tools and learn about the tools and then figure out what are the big gaps of the tools? What do we want to work on and turn those into longer term projects? So we have very little sort of concrete things to show right now. Um, it's more about these are the projects that are um, being planned um, and that we look forward to work, continuing to work on. Um, so what are these projects? Um, we've been having some, some nice progress in, in sort of okay what, what is it going to what is it going to take to so sit down and develop an analog um, standard cell library um, and start figuring out uh, how we want to do that how do we want to meet up and, and make that happen um, other big so that was one that we knew we were going to be um, needing to work on one that um, another project that sort of appeared that was a little bit of a surprise to us was um, figuring that was improving the existing um, the interactiveness of some of the analog circuit simulators, people were um, sort of feeling like the sort of the direct interactive nature that, uh, for instance, something like the Nengo user interface gives um, could help a lot in sort of understanding, um, um, in helping, helping the design of the standard cells and things like that. Um, so there was definitely talk of, can we sort of do a small project that would, that would merge those things together? Um, so that's being uh, you know, sorted out. Um, and so basically taking the, the basic principles that are all very straightforward and very simple math, um, and they all would fit very well within the, um, uh, the graphical, the interactive graphical interfaces that we already have. So um, I think um, we can look at that. One big sort of, uh, uh, one big thing that sort of converged at all of these discussions is especially as people were looking to design what was this question of what do people want to design what is what is a good target to build up out of these standard cells what is a good target to build for these sort of um, uh, circuits and after a lot of discussion um, we kind of uh, converged on this sort of structure here on the right where we have an input that is going to a um a, a, you can think of this as a bank of linear filters but it's it's just it's just a a linear equation that is doing a good job of, of um, representing a time window um, of, of that input and then feeding that to a group of neurons and either doing a winner take all on those group of neurons or doing another layer of rebate. Um, this, this structure gets called a Legendre memory unit, um, but it seems to be a, both a very nice target for implementation in analog and also something that I think could be extremely suitable to a lot of these temporal data sets. Um, and I just added onto this slide as sort of a suggestion, you know, initially said, well, what data set should we use? I would be really curious about applying this um, on the TAC Braille data set that was just talked about. Um, the, the plan for this is to write this, do this entirely in software um, as a first pass so that we can use this as a basis for area power and latency trade-offs um, and see exactly um, as we adjust these sorts of parameters, how does that go ahead and, um, yeah, adjust the model. So, um, so we basically, we have an initial implementation of that, um, and then we need to sort of set that up such that we can vary the parameters and explore this accuracy. Um, I'm also very interested in, um, there's um, some nice possibilities of that structure. If this is an important structure, at the moment our reference implementation of that structure is all in Nango, which is a software toolkit that I'm really familiar with. So I, it means I know exactly what's going on in that model. But there's a bunch of steps that can be seen as sort of black boxes. Um, and so if this is going to be a target for the eventual chip design, um, then I think there really needs to be a pure Python reference implementation that just shows, OK, here is all of the steps of what is needed. Um, and one of the things that we've done with sort of our initial steps in that direction is sort of showing that this system can do a lot of different tasks. So this one system, um, what I'm showing here is doing with that same system, um, doing um, temporal convolution. So you can load in, all right, this is the, just by adjusting the weights of the system, I can load in that this is the symbol I want to do a convolution with. 
and then I can feed in some arbitrary waveform, um, and then you get out um, the convolution of the two. What you're seeing here is in blue is sort of the ideal mathematical convolution, um, and then uh, on top of that is what the network output is. Um, and again, there's parameters you can adjust in order to, to make it a closer match. Um, but that's one thing that this particular component can do. Um, the other things, we, we've also shown some classification examples. So um, here is the system classifying what, you know, here's two, you know, there's just really, really dumb benchmark tasks. Um, here's two different sine waves. Can you classify which one it is? Um, and then on the right, we are showing um, uh, coincidence detection also with this sort of system where I've got two different inputs and I'm looking for a particular pattern of timing between the two inputs. Um, one thing that we were sort of also exploring was just how efficient can this go? And the bottom right one here, we were actually showing this happening in, uh, I think this ended up being 20 neurons. Um, so we were also sort of trying to push down, okay, how, um, how simple can we go? And the idea there is that we could actually explore, well, these are really simple neurons. If you do a more complicated neuron, then you can do the coincidence detection with just one neuron. Um, where is that trade-off? Um, so that's that's exactly what we hope to do with that. Other things um, that are coming up is um, looking at various different mango back. So trying to connect that sort of software to very different sorts of hardware and trying to come up with a common code base behind all of that. It's, again, that's going to be really useful for this eventual chip design. I keep mentioning this chip design thing. Um, so um, this is sort of this was a very surprise project um, and is going to be keeping us busy over probably the next year because it's chip design that's going to take forever. Um, maybe three years, maybe four years, who knows? Um, but there's been a lot of interest in it um, and various different um, um, uh, sorts of possibilities there. I'm extremely quickly just going to say um, one key one is this, um, here's a, a, a bank of neurons of various different uh, various types implement an analog with some sort of uh, floating gate synapses uh, between them. Um, and we've been collecting together. So there's a bunch of um, we've been collecting together various different uh, neuron models that we are looking to implement um, and basically figuring out, okay, can we just at least put them all together um, and have some sort of um, consistent comparison between them. In particular, what we really want is it's not just you know, what does one individual neuron do? It's more about, okay, once you have a group of those neurons in a structure, what are the capabilities of that structure? Um, and that's why, again, we wanna have the sorts of simulations that I was just talking about um, on top of that. Um, so those are all there. I'm also going to pass the microphone over to Andreas, who um, has a, a particular, um, an ultimate, one of the other chip designs that's come up. Um, Andreas, do you want to uh, show your slides? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Let me, can I share my screen? Yep, you should be able to now. Okay, share screen. So uh, just to start, uh, basically uh, during, the, uh, during the workshop, uh, Gert remind, uh, sent this email that there is a competition by solid state circuits. And so it's called SS, uh, solid state circuits PICO challenge. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. What is yep. uh, uh, showing basically we is basically platform independent IC design outreach, and this is really an open source uh, effort to get uh, IC design to encourage participation of pre-college students, undergraduates, underrepresented minorities, and geographical regions that are under are underrepresented in the IC community. This sounds like a good, really good uh, focus for involvement of our neuromorphic community because we've got people all over the world. We like to expand our outreach. And uh, the idea is that people design, uh, propose a design and in a 130 nanometer chip. And uh, uh, so and then, uh, there is a competition, the selected designs will be allowed to be fabbed, and this is a timeline. The announcement was made July 6th during the workshop actually, and the July 3rd is the deadline to submit proposals. I 
we have interacted with various people and we have individuals express interest, my lab, and, and uh, we have a new member actually in our lab, which is Pablo Linares Senaro is for those who know uh, Bernabe and uh, Teresa, he's coming to our lab as a graduate student in the fall. So we'll get him involved in this project. So we have a second generation neuromorph literally uh, be part. We have Gerd's lab uh, in, interested and uh, Jennifer's lab uh, with the FGMOS and INI lab with the bias generators and Terry, and Nikhil and Christoph. Um, really what I thinking is really uh, what I thought we should do is really a simple industrial strength design with industrial industry standard interface, SPI, I square C, CAN, mixed signal design by definition, uh, perhaps a non-uniformity connection. For those who don't know Skywater, it has, it has TSVs. So there is a potential to actually do a stack uh, design. Uh, we have to pay for that. But I think if we get something, I'm sure we can find someone to pay maybe a Kickstarter uh, project to really help fund the workshop in the future. Minimum number of pins. And I'm gonna show this, which is really, I don't know if you know about this. This is really a 32 by 24 infrared array that has four pins, VDD ground, uh, I square C clock and I square C data. And it's basically a 32 by 24 array. I don't know why we shouldn't be able to get a small array and event-based camera that uh, has this kind of format. Uh, these are examples of reference materials, including interfaces from uh, the Linares group of how to convert AER to CAN, which is really one of the standard interfaces uh, and various designs. I'm not sure Toby, we can use Toby's because it's a commercial product, but we can use variants of that. And uh, I mean, and for the cochlea, again, an open source cochlea, I propose that we look at two different approaches to really exercise the tools and the open source uh, design flows. One completely digital that has an I2C SPI PWM or I2S. If you don't know what these things are, they are standard interfaces for microphones. And the other is a mixed signal where there is a pin uh, with a JFET source folder electric microphone and one of the standard outputs. So that's really all I have. LTC presentation now. Um, let me make sure to share for video clip. All good? Okay. Yep, we can see things. So the learning to control challenge was all about learning dynamics from controlled data and optimally controlling the model predictions. And we had a great team of people involved in this, myself and Monfred, a nice expert panel who contributed their time, a great set of invited speakers, and a team who prepared literally since last year's workshop for this year's um, topic area, and a very active team of participants for the projects that they're gonna tell you about now. So now I'll pass that over to Marcin um, to uh, present the first part of the presentation, and then we'll go through the different projects. Thank you, Toby. This year we worked with two truly fascinating systems. First is Carpool, uh, and with Carpool we worked on two different ways. First we had a simulator, but we also had a physical Carpool robot, so that participants were able to call me or call Asuda, and, and then asked for particular experiment or data. And then we also dealt with a second system, uh, even more, more complex one, that is with CAR. And for this, we already last year designed a very nice uh, racing simulator, L to race, learn to race. Good. Now we are able, we, we, we wish to control uh, these systems. And we are particularly interested in uh, MPPI, Model Predictive Path Integral, which is a kind of model predictive control. And what does it all fancy name mean is that this is the, control, the controller, which uh, uh, kind of asks what if, predicts different scenarios, what happens if I give this and that uh, control input, 
and then uh, by some clever uh, averaging chooses the best trajectory, the best control input to follow. Now, in this video, you see a tool we prepared to assess the uh, performance of uh, such MPPI. On the vertical axis, you have position and angle of the cart. On the horizontal axis, you have time. Now, the, uh, the black line is target position of, uh, of the cart, and the green line is actually realized trajectory of the cart. So here you already see that the uh, controller is, is working in this, in this example, yes, because the uh, car is following the target trajectory with some, some delay. And moreover, the angle is kept at, at zero, which means it, it stays, stays upright. But now the most interesting part, I would say, of, of this picture are these faint green lines, which displays the simulated trajectories, what, what the controller thinks could happen, and they are averaged to this uh, red line, which is what controller thinks is the best trajectory. Good. But now our aim was not only to control the system, but also control uh, them based on model learned from uh, experiment recordings from, from data. And for this, we used neural networks. Uh, and here you also see a tool we prepared uh, to test the quality of predictions done either by multilayer perceptron or GRU, that is recurrent neural network. And what you see in uh, this video on the left, uh, on the vertical axis, again, angle of the, uh, the, the pole, on the uh, horizontal axis time, the uh, black dotted line is the experiment re recording how the angle was changing over time. And now this small colorful dots are what the network thinks where the pole will be in the future, given it is uh, in, the, in the current moment in this green, green dot point. OK, uh, this was our starting positions. Uh, now, at the beginning of uh, Telluride, we performed a small poll. We, uh, we asked participants uh, to which project they would like to commit. And the most uh, interesting, uh, or for, for most of them, uh, the most interesting <laughs> was the uh, studying system dynamics uh, or doing system dynamics prediction for Cartpole or l 2 race with spiking neural network. But there were also many people interested in implementing like classical uh, RNN, classical uh, GRU for car dynamics in uh, uh, learning uh, learn to, uh, to, to race simulator. Also, there were people interested in, in working uh, with physical car pull, and even more projects were born uh, already during uh, these two weeks of, of Telluride. So now we will dive a bit uh, deeper into details and uh, present this all sub projects one after another. And I would like to invite uh, Eustus to tell you a few words about uh, the spiking neural network. Uh, project. Thank you, Marcin. Um, uh, I would like to tell you something that we would like. To, we had the idea of predicting the card pool dynamics with spike neural networks and using those for control. And I was not alone in the project. As you can see, there were many people involved in this, and I'm very thankful to got this uh, fantastic support over the last two weeks. Um, if you would click, please. Yes, you can see that we built um, um, a schematic of the network architecture here on the left. On the, on the left-hand side of the image, there is the uh, input, that is the true state and the true action of the system. And um, the true state is first through this blue connection fed into a believed state. And later we do not use the blue connection anymore, but instead use from the right-hand side of the model, the, the green connection to use the own prediction of the model as the believed state. And you can see that this is a recurrent cycle. So um, this is an autoregressive model, which was uh, learned using the online learning rule in uh, uh, Nengo. So we implemented this entire network in Nengo with a lot of help from Terry Stewart, big shout out there for uh, great support. And on the next slide, we can see some of the um, initial results we got. So on the top left, what we can see here um, is a learning curve. So on the y-axis, of course, uh, learning error. And on the x-axis is the number of training examples. 
And the orange curve shows us what if we use as a prediction for the next state, we just use the current state. So that's a pretty um, simple assumption. And of course, that's not a great assumption. Um, if we use a linear extrapolation based on the current state and the past state, um, that is the green curve that we can see. And what was really uh, nice for us that after two hard weeks of work, we could um, have a model that actually outperforms this linear extrapolation with one step look ahead prediction. Um, yes. And if we click uh, one more, please, then we can see on the bottom here, um, we have five of the state variables of the card pool system on the, on the y-axis. And um, one example, um, time, uh, four second example unrolled over time on the x-axis and how these um, uh, variables develop over time. And what we did now is for the first second on the, on the left here, we gave the, the true state as the model input. And after that, we stopped giving the true state and instead the model only got its own prediction. So uh, we can see that for about another second, the model was quite stable in its predictions um, after this uh, fairly short training time and um, could accurately predict the, the, the future states of the model given the action. And after that, on the right-hand side, we can see that um, the model was a bit um, unstable and um, the error, of course, accumulates over time. And if we click once more, then we can see um, that we tried to implement this model in the uh, Carpool system and run the Brunton test, which we just saw uh, explained by Marson. And what we would like to see, of course, is that the, um, the, the trajectories um, predicted by the model, which is in this case, the specifically the yellow dots, that is one second into the future should be well aligned with the underlying black line. And for the position of the card, this works absolutely well. Um, and for the angle, we can see that there is a little bit of um, uh, still room for improvement, I would like to say. And, um, but this is some fantastic initial results. And if you click one final time for me, then um, this is very promising and we would really like to keep uh, refining this method and keep working on this. And um, with that, I would like to pass on to Michael, who also worked on the um, carpal dynamics, but with a non-spiking network. Thanks, Thank Eustace. Uh, so this week, I've been working on online training of a multilayer perceptron for model predictive uh, control system adaptation. Um, so initially, I was interested in a multilayer perceptron because it would be a lot simpler to implement in a real-time hardware system. Um, but throughout the workshop, this idea sort of pivoted to trying to implement an adaptive model that could basically train online to capture evolving system dynamics and maintain control of a system as it ages. Um, so starting with just looking at the MLP. Uh, next. Uh, here's a video of the swing-up maneuver, as we call it. Basically, the pole starts hanging vertically down. It's a little bit cut off. Then the controller is able to move the cart back and forth to actually swing the pole up and then move the cart to the set point. Um, so we characterize the time for swing up to be how long it takes for the cart to sit at the set point for about one second with a stable angle and stable position. Um, so we characterize the MPPI controller with three different models. Uh, the first being the true model parameters. So this is the system dynamics that like runs the simulation, like the true kinematic equations, a uh, recurrent neural network, and then a multilayer perceptron. Um, the big takeaway here was that the multilayer perceptron and recurrent neural network were both able to capture the cart pull dynamics well enough for the controller to perform a swing up. And actually the perceptron was actually able to capture the dynamics sufficiently that the performance was roughly on par with the true model parameters. Uh, next. I'm sorry. Um, so the goal here oh. sorry, uh, was to use online learning to capture slow drifts in the system dynamics. In a real system, this could be given by friction increases or by the motor wearing out over time. Um, so we represented this in the simulation with the length of the pole decreasing over the run. Um, you can kind of see this in that video there. Basically, as the length of the pole shrinks over time, the control gets shakier until a certain point where the model's predictions are just inaccurate and the controller isn't able to maintain stability and kind of the system just catastrophically fails. 
So the idea behind this controller is that we're going to use our model to simulate potential inputs, evaluate how well they perform, and then determine the best input from that. So why can't we just store the control inputs and our measured states over time and then periodically train the neural network with this new fresh data? And this would hopefully allow us to capture these changing system dynamics and adapt to the dynamical system as it changes over time. Um, so this implementation is still a work in progress, but hopefully it goes well. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass it to Levi to talk about performing system identification with a physical cart pull. Thanks, Michael. So in this work with Asuda and Marcin, we sought to automatically identify the parameters of a physical cart pull, such as the mass, length, or friction, in order to predict its motion with the Newtonian model. We are interested in a classical model because its use in the simulator will improve the sim to real transfer of the learning-based methods. On the left, we have a photo of this cart pull, which we used to collect training data. Once we had the training data, we applied nonlinear least squares optimization to find parameters for the Newtonian model that minimize the error between the predicted trajectory and the recorded trajectory. To find parameters suitable for long-term prediction, we iteratively solve the n-step prediction problem starting from three steps and ending at 115 steps, using the results of the previous optimization as the initializer for the next. The training used five seconds or about a thousand samples of recorded data of the pole being balanced via hand-tuned PID. On the right, we actually have an animated plot of the resulting predictions of position, velocity, angle, and angular velocity. The blue line in the floor pods represents the recorded states, while the orange line represents the predicted states for a half second horizon, or about 100 steps. The identified parameters will be further verified by using them to design a linear LQR controller for the physical cart pole. And once that's done, the parameters will be transferred to the park pole cart simulator to improve the simulation accuracy. This wraps up the cart pole experiments. Next, Florian will discuss neural MPC for L2 race. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce the neural model predictive controller in our l race framework. And the problems that we solved were quite, si quite similar, uh, like in the card pole uh, simulator, but we have a card this time. And the question we want to ask is, uh, can we learn car dynamics and use it for optimal control? First of all, what is the optimal control? Uh, let's assume we have a car at the red dot position and we have a, a trajectory that we want to follow, which is in our case, the racetrack in black. And the model predictive path integral, which the others already talked about, is basically just to try out random control inputs over a horizon. And we rate them with a cost function. And in our case, the cost function is like the difference, the distance to the track. For example, if we steer too hard to the left, we will leave the track. This will result in a low in a high cost function. And if we steer too little, it will the car will also leave the track um, and will again result to a high cost. And to find the optimal control, we average over all rollouts weighted by the inverse cost. And this is how we find the optimal control. And now we want to learn the trajectory predictions with neural networks. And what we do here is we take the car state as an input, and then we predict with a neural network the next state. And to get a whole trajectory, we feed back the next states again in an autogressive manner, as already seen before um, with the car pole. And we'd like to show you a video of the results, but before I give my word to Arthur, Arthur, which worked with one of those neural network implementations to predict the next states. So now, do we have Arthur with us? Can you hear me? Yeah, we do. Okay, so I've trained uh, two LSTM neural networks. Uh, the first one is to predict future states and commands from the current state. So the data was collected using the pure pursuit controller and we had uh, 4968 vectors for training and 553 vectors for testing. Uh, the neural network had 7,338 parameters. So on the upper, uh, this first uh, linearized dynamic equation shows you what I implemented. 
uh, on the upper left plot, I'm showing the XY track two trajectories over six laps of the race car. The green is the ground truth. Red is the LSTM state plus command XY predictor output. Blue is the six dimensional second order common filtered XY output. On the right hand side is the LSTM neural network evolving with feedback and with no external input. The lower left hand, the lower left plot, I'm showing the predicted steering angle sequence. And on the lower right hand side is the predicted throttle command sequence. So uh, the steering angle is predicted well, but the uh, throttle and brake sequences had uh, this on off pulse like nature, and the LSTM is uh, having a hard time predicting it. What it is in fact doing is predicting an integrated version of these sequences. Uh, the second LSTM model that I trained was to predict future states from current states and commands, and this model will be integrated with an information theoretic model predictive uh, control algorithm based on work done by Georgia Tech, and that is the reference. Excellent. So uh, that leads me to introduce the next thing, which is uh, a recording of a real race between this year's Florian's model uh, multi-layer perceptron dynamics prediction uh, model predictive controller versus last year's Antonio's pure pursuit proportional derivative controller. So I'll just play this video for you and narrate over it. The race will start at the starting line here and then you'll see the two cars racing against each other. This is a race between the agents of Florian who represents this year and Marcin who ran last year's. Okay, the white car is the neural network. The red car is last year's per pursuit controller which just plans smooth trajectory through the next few points using a linear steering controller. You can see that the white car is passing through this sharp turn straight through it because it can plan an optimal trajectory of low cost. And it's actually starting to slide around this curve. The red car, Pure Pursuit, attempts to make it around this turn up, but it can't do it and it gets stuck in the sand there. It gradually makes it out of the sand where the friction is much higher. But in the meantime, the white car is racing around and getting even faster and faster. And now you can see this yellow arrow here shows the sideways slip of the car, it's starting to slide around the curves. And you can see it again in this curve where it's really sliding and um, it's at the limit of traction. Now it's about to lap the red car uh, already by the third lap, I think. And here it's lapped the red car. We don't have car collision, so it's, it's not knocked out for a penalty there. Um, you can see in this video that the uh, neural predictive controller just is clearly superior. Even right here, when it goes crazy and does a donut, it recovers and makes it across the starting line. And no way a linear controller could do that, okay? So we're extremely encouraged by the progress compared to last year. Okay, so now to finish, I think the last thing that we're gonna show you is from Chang. So Chang, you take over. He really contributed some interesting stuff, which has a lot of uh, potential for next year. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, I'll be telling you learning to control wheel robots with unique morphology. As you can see in the video, the robot has some special designs uh, in terms of its morphology. Uh, click. So we have a front wheel that can steer and we have a back wheel that can only drive on sideways. So this robot in order to balance has to move the back wheels to the left or to the right and keep the center mass on the top, uh, similar to the carpal dynamics. So uh, uh, click next. Yeah. So this robot is integrated with the IMU from Bosch, which give us estimate of angle and angular uh, uh, velocity, based on which we create feedback to control the wheel and keep the robot balanced. Uh, next. Uh, next, yeah. So on the right figure shows uh, our uh, what's special in terms of our controller. So as you can see here, it's the changing of the measure uh, angle of the robot over time. And what we learn here is actually the uh, uh, a safe region. Inside this region, a linear controller can keep the robot balanced. But outside this region, once the perturbation is detected as represented by the black dots, then the controller will converge faster than a linear controller. And once we return to the safe region, then we can rely on a linear controller. And finally, uh, next. I would like to point out uh, the current progress so far is the new, new point, new starting point for a new pro uh, project later on. So in this project, we extend the wheels 
such that this robot, a motorcycle-like robot can drive like a motorcycle, but also have tractions on the sideways. So thank you so much. That's gonna be a real challenge to control, especially with this heavy weight on top. Okay, so that's it. Thanks to all the great LTC21 contributors. And uh, we just asked a lot more questions, but we made some concrete steps in those directions. Great, thank you, Toby. And we don't have time for questions, so I think we should go on to the next group. <laughs> so let's go on straight to... Um... Yeah, so I think, Stefan, you, you're gonna start right away, right? Is it presentation, yeah. Yep, and Paolo is going to be our uh, slide MC. All right, so one second. And here we go. All right, so I'm gonna introduce uh, the neuromodulatory control group. Um, and uh, I just wanna start by uh, stating the goal of this group. Thanks, Paolo. Uh, yeah, this one. And that is to understand fundamental principles of neuromodulation phenomenon of biology in order to engineer devices with uh, certain beneficial features of biological systems. And I wanna highlight um, two uh, important features of biology that came out of the week one talk uh, of Eve Martyr, uh, which is that neuromodulation, one can change circuit dynamics uh, to meet the demands of a changing environment. And so is a kind of behavioral plasticity um, the other is that neuromodulation stabilizes circuit function by compensating for uh, variable components as well as external perturbations. Um, so keep these two features in mind. I also want to uh, uh, put on, your, uh, on the table for now two important fundamental principles that uh, the Trans-Oceanic Brain Trust uh, has, has taught us um, in this group. Um, uh, including Rodolphe and, and others. And uh, that's this idea of thinking of neurons as uh, mixed feedback devices, uh, um, the mix being between positive and negative feedback, um, which can exist at multiple timescales. Um, and in this um, uh, uh, formulation, you can explain uh, phenomenon, phenomena such as spiking and, and bursting in neurons. Um, as well, uh, more to the point of this group, neuromodulation modulates the strength of these feedback elements um, in order to change circuit dynamics. And I want to highlight the importance of this, uh, this modeling framework in contrast to um, a biophysically realistic um, uh, modeling framework, which would include the, uh, the various uh, conductances of biology, which are rich and, and redundant, um, and also in contrast to uh, minimal models of excitability, which give a phase portrait uh, uh, picture of um, excitability, but um, uh, don't give as much perhaps uh, uh, interpretability for, for engineers like, like this approach does. Um, and I wanna demonstrate the um, usefulness of this approach on the, on the next slide. Um, and this, this will show you, hopefully, uh, we'll see the video in one sec. Um, that uh, using this, this uh, mixed feedback and, and modulation approach, uh, we can uh, already in software uh, begin to implement um, some of the beneficial features of biology, including uh, circuit plasticity. Um, so what we're gonna show is uh, if you look off left, uh, this is a cartoon model of an important uh, central pattern genera generator uh, known as the stomatogastric ganglion uh, in, in crustaceans. And this, uh, the rhythm of this circuit is important for behavior such as swallowing and chewing. Um, and to give you a brief uh, introduction uh, to this uh, circuit, um, it consists of, uh, you'll see two pairs of neurons that are mutually inhibiting one another, depicted by those black lines with the circles. Um, and actually what happens is the, the pairs will, will trade off bursting. So one will burst and inhibit the other, and, and then the other will, will come on and, and, and burst and inhibit the other one. Um, and using uh, our modeling approach, we can have two uh, speeds of, of such a rhythm coexist stably um, in the circuit configuration. 
and then using neuromodulation uh, in order to change the, the gain of the slow negative feedback, which, um, uh, so, sorry, slow positive feedback, um, which uh, enables the, the bursting behavior, uh, we can toggle uh, these uh, rhythms on and off in, in, in real time. And um, uh, the circuit will, um, will go back and forth between behavioral regimes. So now we'll play a quick video um, with the five neural traces. Initially, you'll see the slow rhythm on top and the fast rhythm. Yeah, thanks, Paolo. Uh, the fast rhythm down below. Um, and you see the, the bursting at two different time scales. Uh, and then the one in the middle, three, which is electrically uh, coupled, will, will kind of exhibit a, mi a mixture of the two rhythms. And then around um, right there, um, you can play it now, Paolo. Um, I'll turn the, the slow rhythm up top uh, off with, with neuromodulation uh, and the, the fast one will exist. And now the, I'll turn also the, the fast uh, rhythm off, neurons four and five. So now uh, four neurons are silent, five, uh, the, the fifth is spiking. So both uh, rhythms are off. And this is uh, another, another behavioral regime. And if you uh, follow along the video further, now I'll turn uh, both rhythms back on. So first comes the slow up top and you see neuron three is following the slow. And then the fast rhythm again comes on by modulating now the neurons four and five uh, positive, slow positive feedback. And we're back to where we started. So this is uh, hopefully uh, shows you that one important feature of neuromodulation. And that's the bit about um, uh, circuit dynamic plasticity. And I want to briefly comment on, on the next slide about the other uh, feature, uh, which is about stability of uh, circuit function. And this, this is less developed and, and there's more um, uh, to do on this. But uh, just last night, uh, the, the group of us uh, were able to uh, implement um, something akin to uh, temperature sensitivity uh, as an external perturbation in, in this model STG. Um, what I mean by that is if the, the problem the STG faces uh, in the face of changing temperature is uh, analogous to if a conductor uh, were to tell the orchestra to speed up or slow down and all the players hear a slightly different message. So they all speed up or slow down at different rates. Um, and somehow the, the song is still coherent at the end. The phase relationships are, are maintained. Um, I borrowed that analogy from a podcast with uh, Eve Martyr and Steve Strogatz just to mention um, so here I've, I've, uh, we've uh, quickly implemented um, uh, this kind of um, perturbation in which temperature is globally altered. However, all the uh, feedback elements um, have a characteristic value which determines how sensitive they are to temperature change. And so they're all changing at different rates. Um, and I hope, hope you can just appreciate um, that within this 10 uh, degree uh, change uh, from five to 15, um, our uh, a pair of rhythms at, at 10 uh, Celsius um, are, are sensitive to uh, this, this range. And so the challenge going forward um, is to uh, understand how neuromodulation um, can, can uh, use the, the, the redundancy, the richness, uh, the overlapping voltage and, and uh, time dependencies of the conductances in order to uh, transition through mechanisms to maintain phase relationships. Um, and, and that's what we'll continue working on. But without further ado, uh, I want to uh, now go from biology, okay, software, and now uh, to more software and hardware along our, our neuromorphic spectrum. Hi, yeah, so I'm, I'm Bree, and I'll be taking over briefly. Um, so obviously what you've just seen is, is one type of model, um, and there are many types of models that we can use to, to think about modeling you know, um, biological networks and whatnot. Um, so we're currently kind of in this work group uh, looking at and working with the below four, the IV models that you just saw demonstrated with Stefan, um, traditional Hodgkin-Huxley models, um, and then we have this Neurodin chip that we have the hardware of, and we also have created software models of it um, to try to bridge that connection more directly between software and hardware. Um, and so ideally, we'd like to be able to translate these network designs seamlessly between these models. So we could, you know, ideally take that, um, that lovely pattern of activity that we just saw and put it directly onto our chip. Um, so advance, um, unfortunately, that is not an incredibly straightforward process, but it's something we're working on. 
Um, so the process of translating a designed neuron or whole network from one model to another is currently done um, by trying to match the gating variables, um, but that is a noisy fitting. And in addition to that, the physical chips have very physical constraints, uh, which can be modeled in their software versions, um, but they also have physical sources of noise, which can be trickier to deal with and less predictable. Um, so due to that, sometimes the desired network behavior is lost in translation. Um, and when this happens, there are approximately two options. Um, you can try to retune it by hand of, of take your initial translation and try to just alter it um, little by little, try to figure out where the issue is and provide uh, adjustments to try to get your desired behavior back. Or you can completely start from scratch, um, which is essentially what we've been doing thus far. So if you want to advance again. Um, so here on the left, you'll see that same network that you just saw um, in the IV model. And then on the right is an analogous network um, trying to get the same behavior um, in the Hodgkin-Huxley model. And this was done you know, essentially entirely separately. We didn't use a, um, an algorithm or anything to, to transfer between one and the others. They were built up um, distinctly separately. And that is something that we hope to not have to do for everything we're interested in going forward. Um, and obviously we would like to get these in the Neurodin software and hardware as well. Um, and we currently don't have that, but we are working on it. And one of the ways we're working on it, I will pass on to the next speaker. Okay, um, okay guys, so this is Paul. So as we have seen, um, th there is a mismatch between uh, when transferring the parameters from Hodgkin and Huxley to, um, to neuroline simulation, right? So uh, the, the problem is that um, because of hardware limitation, we cannot change these parameters. We cannot transfer these parameters directly 100% accurate to this the to the neuroline parameter, parameter, right? Without changing the behavior of the actual neuron. Uh, we can see here like we had a Hodgkin and Huxley that was spiking here, but when we transfer it to, to neuroline and then the model does not spike anymore. And so th this is something that we would like to address, right? Um, we were trying, well, the, the first approach was trying to, okay, uh, I know that I have this, this, and I want this, uh, this behavior to happen. So I can start like changing these parameters, try to see what happens when, when I change this and, and see the, output, the actual output, right? Of the system of neurodegenerative. And the problem is that by doing hand tuning, it's so difficult to do that. So we need a better approach, right? We need to um, we need to try to improve that uh, our, our approach. Okay, so we want a, a guided first. Uh, our task was how to uh, start making sense of the of the actual neuron, so we can at least we can say like, okay, if we modify this parameter like a little bit, then my my system is going to improve a little bit or something like that. So, but then the, there is this problem that uh, we have the neural model, which is uh, Hodgkin and Huxley. And as we know, it's extremely complicated. And, and if we try to start making sense of this model, then it, it just quickly, uh, the, the model just quickly uh, blows out in, in the, the complexity just explodes, right? Because M, H, and N are dynamic equations and also your your memory potential is a dynamic equation. So we want to see uh, how can we change from this to something like this, less complex, less, less complex, right? So uh, that is linear, uh, linearization of conductances um, in its approach. It's an approach that uh, Alessio was presenting, the, Alessio and Luca were presenting the, uh, in, in, the, in these past weeks. So what can we do? So uh, what, what we can do is like, this is the complete model of the system. But if we start just looking at exact point, points in time, then the model reduces to like a simple linear equation. How simple? This simple. You, you are going to trans, transform this completely, uh, this complex equation into a linear equation in which you only, you can see like if, if you start just looking at one point in time, you will see that uh, your next, uh, 
how your current is going to change in the next time step is just going to depend to, uh, to this variable, which in turn, um, they only depend on your, uh, your current voltage in time, right? So then uh, this complex dynamic equation just turns out to be, uh, or just switches or can be approximated by a simple linear equation that only depends on, on the voltage. And now you can start plotting. Like you, you have the currents here and this current is going to be a, it's going to be a function of your um, um, resistance of, of, of uh, your um, conductance that, uh, that uh, is a function of your current voltage. And of course that uh, you, you are measuring now, you are, because you are analyzing a functional moments in time, you are not measuring the complete behavior of the system, but you are measuring uh, how your currents or your voltages uh, or your voltages are going to change uh, in that moment in time to the next moment in time, right? So let's see what can we do with this. Uh, so we had this problem that if, if we switch from Hodgkin and Hodgkin to Neuralink, we cannot uh, like make sense of what is happening here. That there is some mismatch here, but it, it changes uh, the behavior of the system. But how can we make sense of it, right? So then, um, but let's just complicate it a little bit more. Instead of looking at just one neuron, like this, just one neuron, uh, we can start looking at a. Uh, a uh, two neurons, right? Two neurons couple that in, in, if you couple two neurons, then you will have a booster. Uh, at first, if you have a neuron, if you have just one neuron, then you will have um, that you, your behavior is going to depend on three currents, on the three ion currents, sodium, potassium, and lead current. But if you add another one and you couple them together, uh, then you can make like this and turn out into a booster that is going to depend on five uh, different ion currents. Uh, you are going to have your uh, normal currents and then you are going to add two more currents, the, the calcium and the calcium potassium gated current. And that makes you a booster, okay? So what happens when we change this booster, booster into neuroline? Or uh, let's just say if we uh, apply some perturbation to the parameters of the, this booster, uh, then we will have this, uh, this final behavior, which is something that we don't want, right? Um, but uh, as we have seen, we have linearization of conductances to, to try to make sense of it and try to approach it. So now, instead of looking at, at the final behavior, we can look at the at the conductances, okay, okay and, and try to make sense. Like for example, if I am at 20 volts, uh, 20 millivolts right now, and if, if at this moment in time I am in 20 millivolts, then I will have that my uh, conductance for the sodium channel is going to be this high and the, the other conductances are going to be like this. And then you, you can see how it's going for the next moment in time, how the, your, uh, your voltage is going to change, right? And then you can also see uh, th this one's for the Hodgkin and Hodgkin, and then you will have something like similar for uh, your new uh, or your transfer uh, neurodyne or for your model with some perturbation. And then you will see that there is a mismatch. So for this one, you, you had this curve, but for this one, because of applying some perturbation, you will end up with this. Uh, the light ones are the original ones, the Hodgkin and Hodgkin, and the uh, the darker ones are uh, the darker uh, curves are for the perturbed neuron. Okay, you can see that there is a mismatch in, in the behavior that will that will affect your behavior, and at the end will will produce that uh, that thing that we we didn't want. Okay, so uh, what else can we do? We can start like messing around with this one and now we can, we can make like, we can uh, move a little bit the conductances, the resting potentials and, and all of this and actually see this, uh, how these parameters affect 
to this linear model, right? And, and then we can start making a little bit more sense, more, more sense of what is happening inside the neural. And for doing that, we, we've constructed, uh, of, we have implemented an interface and uh, an interface to do that. Like uh, you, you can do it uh, online, you can change the parameters here. And then you will see how uh, your conductances move or how your conductances react to the change of some of your param parameters, which you have a lot, right? For the Hodgkin and Huxley neuron and with five ion channels, you have these many parameters. You have these general parameters and for each channel, you have also another like six or seven parameters. So that, uh, and then you can, but at least you can start making sense of it, right? And let's apply the uh, let's apply this. Uh, we 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 kind of try changing here the parameters, and then we can at least try to uh, follow the the original conductances or try to uh, to get the, the original conductances back, right? Like like you, you can see that uh, uh, there is a little mismatch here, but at least we are trying to 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 compensate for the mismatches that we had. Okay, uh, let's, up, up, uh, let's do something else. We, we want to translate, then we want to translate the-, the Just to quickly uh, break in, we've got, we're, you're, you're over your time, but just keep going, but you're, you are over your time. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so we want to uh, apply this method to translate the STG uh, system that, uh, that was presented before. And how can we do that? Um, first, we need to, um, to present the Hodgkin and Hodgkin uh, to construct the Hodgkin and Hodgkin bursting neurons and then transfer to neurodyne. And we can do that by using the, this interface and we can try to tune, in, tune them, but of course we are still tuning by hand. And our ne next approach would be like, um, how can we go from this hand tuning to an automated uh, approach? And that would be it for me. Great, so moving forward, we definitely hope to continue on a lot of these projects, um, really seeing where that, that temperature robustness of the STG using neuromodulatory, neuromodulatory control can go. It'd be super interesting to see if we can compensate, to what extent we can compensate um, for, for differences in temperature. Um, and then uh, translating that network onto the Neurodin software and hardware, which I think we're making advances toward, which would be super exciting to implement that network physically. Um, and then we can go back and replicate those temperature experiments. I think the idea was thrown out of using a hair dryer on the chip to heat it up um, and see, see how that plays out you know, in, in action. Um, and then of course, keeping working on these um, translation between models to make that a more seamless or uh, more straightforward procedure so we don't have to build everything from the ground up every time we want to get to a new model um, and hopefully more to continue kind of working in this system and a big thank you to all of our work group our fearless leaders all of our expert panels the team that walked us through it and all of my fellow participants so thank you awesome fantastic perfect timing any questions about this about the no, much. I like the hair dryer test. That's the real proof. Put the hair dryer on it, and it still works. Uh, that would be really convincing. Or the Any ice questions? Yes. Or the ice chiller. Yeah, that's harder to put on it, though. I guess you could spray it with with the the chiller spray. That's the old test, right? You, if you want to find a, a loose connection, right? You spray with the chiller. We around Carver's lab, we always had these chiller cans, and if you suspected you had a bad solder joint, you would just blast it with this ice cold spray. If you ever blast on your skin, you'd get a terrible burn, freeze your skin instantly. But that's how you could tell that the solder joint was bad. Also, but that's if different. You want, if you want to find out whether the chip is dead or is heated up, and which chip on the body is dead, you you do the same thing, and you can see which yeah. area is hot. So thank you, uh, Rudolf and Gerd, for bringing this nice topic area into the workshop. And that's really it um, for the workshop. I guess that's it for the topic areas. And now- Hey, we have SMI. One more. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, <laughs> Shichi. Terrible. <laughs> so now we go to the sensory motor integration topic area.
Thank you, Toby. Do you see my screen? Yeah, beautiful. Yes. All right, great. So uh, the goal of the sensory motor integration uh, topic area was to study inference and learning in a model of the visual system by using an event stream input and applying it to a maze navigation task. And uh, this project was both uh, fascinating and challenging because we integrated a lot of new components that hadn't been used in that combination before. For instance, we used a neuromorphic uh, neurobotics platform from the Human Brain Project together with the dynamic vision sensor or an emulator of it um, and a, mod a sizable model of the um, visual uh, stream and it finally deployed or with a target to deploy it on Lui hardware. So um, this will be a story of the implementation of these components, the integration. Uh, luckily, we have a fantastic team of participants who really uh, um, uh, were very dedicated and active in putting this together. We had a great support team uh, and uh, they also contributed several very nice tutorials that explain all of these tools, which we can go back to later. And um, we had a fantastic team of speakers as well. And the nice thing uh, about this is that we had both very seasoned and, and veteran uh, Telluride participants, but also um, uh, newcomers to the neuromorphic community that resonated very well with what we are doing here and are hopefully going to establish very uh, fruitful and promising collaborations in the future. And with this, I'll hand over to Sami. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, it's Sami. Uh, le just let me share my screen. Okay, here we are. So uh, to begin this project, uh, we had to uh, set up the whole RL pipeline with uh, with all the the tools uh, that were given to us. So that's basically the the goal of the of the project one. So we wanted to uh, make uh, some sort of uh, robot navigation through a maze uh, using only uh, RGB frames uh, with uh, some uh, DQN uh, reinforcement learning um, agents. So we don't have uh, any uh, slam-based uh, algorithm. Uh, all the navigation is uh, conducted by the robot, uh, by the RL pipeline. Uh, so as a as uh, some components, we had uh, the neurobotic platforms uh, or the NLP, uh, which uh, which we will use to um, to simulate uh, all the physics uh, in the maze environment, uh, all the robotics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, as a neural agent, uh, we focused on a, a standard a double DQN uh, using uh, PyTorch and uh, PFRL, which is a simple library to implement some uh, some RL algorithm. And uh, the, the, the interesting part here is uh, the visual extractor to extract some features from the RGB frames. Uh, we wanted to compare uh, a baseline CNN uh, with a more bio-inspired uh, CNN, uh, which is uh, V1Net, uh, which are, and I will explain uh, this model uh, a little bit later. So our objective with this project is to explore uh, the task in itself, so the mapless robot navigation task uh, with uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, we wanted also to compare uh, various uh, visual feature extractor, uh, so the baseline standard CNN or the V1Net, etc., etc. And uh, mainly we wanted to study the performance of uh, bio-inspired vision models uh, for, robot for robotic navigation. So uh, here I show you a idle, uh, idle picture of the, the maze environment in, in the neurobotic platform. So we have the robot at the center here. It's the start of the maze. Um, and uh, there are some obstacles to avoid uh, in, the, in the environment. And of course, here we, you have the, the target, the goal. Um, basically, uh, to to introduce some uh, some uh, hints to the robot, uh, we added some uh, MNIST uh, MNIST pictures uh, in the walls, and basically, when uh, a, a higher number is showed um, is shown, it's uh, it means that uh, the robot is uh, in the right path. Okay, uh, as the visual feature extractor, uh, as I said before, uh, we used V1Net, uh, which, uh, which is um, a CNN uh, with a little particularity. 
Um, so basically, it consists of uh, our first convolution block layer, uh, which is um, a model of the primate V1 neurons. Uh, and I'm, show, I'm showing it here. Uh, it, it's composed of, um, of a convolutional layer uh, composed of GABA fetal bank uh, with thick way, fixed weights. So the fixed weights uh, are taken uh, with uh, related to some experiments. Uh, in the V1 neurons of the primates and, uh, and humans. Then you have uh, a nonlinear layer activations uh, that model um, either uh, simple uh, cells or complex cells. And then uh, some sort of uh, stochasticity generator of V1 neurons uh, are added at the end. And after this V1 block, basically, uh, you can uh, plug in uh, any standard CNN uh, you want. Um, so it, it can be a, a LexNet, ResNet, or even a CoreNetS, which is a, another um, sort of, uh, of uh, bio-inspired CNN model. Uh, the advantage of the V1 net is that it's uh, more robust to uh, it, it has been shown to be more robust to uh, adversarial attacks. Uh, so um, we wanted to see uh, if uh, it performs well on uh, other uh, on other uh, subjects that uh, than uh, robustness uh, and so forth. Okay, uh, so what we achieved with this uh, project, uh, basically um, for all the implementation part, uh, it was uh, quite difficult, but uh, the aerial pipeline is set up. So uh, all the environment, edge detection, et cetera, et cetera, have, have been made, have been implemented. Um, and uh, so uh, we, we can say that uh, we closed the loop uh, for training uh, any model, uh, a bio spawn model like a V1 net or a standard uh, CNN uh, with reinforcement learning on the maze. However, uh, a blocking problem uh, was that uh, the NRP is not integrated with uh, GPU. Um, so training, basically training an aerial agent uh, in the in the maze could take uh, weeks or, or even months. Uh, so uh, it was not possible to uh, to launch some experiment uh, and have result at the end of the of the terror ride workshop. Um, but uh, what's what is uh, what is interesting here is that um, the next version of NLP uh, will address this uh, GPU and deep learning integration uh, to make this kind of um, of use case possible. So that's uh, that's a good thing for next year, for example. And with this, I will pass over my uh, my colleague Michael. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, I was working on, uh, or sorry, we were working on a project that was a variation on uh, uh, the RL pipeline concept, where instead of using a, a visible light RGB camera, we'd be using a DBS as input. Um, and we managed to successfully uh, <clears throat> integrate the, the V2E, is the camera simulator, into the neural robotics platform. Um, and we now have set up, uh, as a result of this project, a ROS module that can be integrated in further experiments that can do that processing uh, uh, for anybody else who wants to for, you know, continued experimentation, which is sort of the next steps of post Telluride, what to do with this, yeah, with this project. Unfortunately, we had a lot of the same uh, challenges as in the previous project, which was um, uh, training the VRL agent. Um, and then we also had another interesting uh, problem in that we lost uh, some of the texture in the camera view that was fed into the event camera. So if we look at this video of the simulation running, we'll see a number nine show up in the visible camera, but we don't see that texture uh, in the events. And that's because that this, this stream here, it turns out is not the video stream that's being fed into the event camera. Uh, but again, successful integration uh, and for the sake of sanity, we will see that in fact we can see those numbers uh, when we're processing that data stream um, offline, and that they clearly show up in the system. Uh, 
so all in all, uh, integrated into the system, and I think we have a decent starting point for future experimentation. Thanks. Sorry, and there's one more project, which is. Um, yes, next up is Tim. I think he's on it. Thanks. Hi, sorry. Uh, hold on. Right, so this part of the project is to explore um, training a viewer net with core net um, with DECO, which is the free effect learning rule. So um, in, in this amazing environment in the reinforcement learning setting. So we will take the event frames that is converted by V2E from the previous project and then train it with the reward signal in the RM framework with the kill function or the policy network. So uh, this is the entire block. So we have the freedom block, Cornet, and the SNN, train with the code. This pass is aimed to be pre-trained. Um, so we want to compare the brain score of the free one net um, train on events versus trains on uh, RGB frames. And uh, so uh, it's hard to train the core nets from end to end uh, with the free one block and SNN. So first we try to use the free one block directly with the SNN without the core net. And this achieved the accuracy of around 89% with three layers of SNN. And this is quite a bit lower than the accuracy of the SNN on its own, trained with the code, which can reach about 99%. And this could possibly be caused of the fact that the V1 NAC, sorry, the V1 block was designed for RGB channels and more design work needs to be done for the on and off channels of the event frames. Uh, so we also try to uh, train with the core net on M MNIST. Um, so the strategy was to convert one of the uh, core net V1 layer into a spiking version using the recurrent neural networks um, formulation of the SNN. And in self way sharing, we use local connections in the uh, conf layer. So training on the MNIST data set uh, was quite slow, uh, possibly due to an issue with the data loader. So this needs more work um, in the future. Um, so finally, uh, we want to look at the brain score, which is a score on how well the features extracted by the convolutional layer com when compared to the uh, activity that we have in, in the brain uh, from the fMRI scans. So uh, for this task, um, because the RF framework is not ready, so we just use an autoencoder. And we take um, the maze RGB inputs as well as the uh, event uh, frames converted by the V2E uh, and, and put it into this autoencoder with the Buon block and the core net. And, and then we compare the brain score between these two types of inputs. So the, the, the like preliminary results from um, training on this limited data set is the uh, 0.1899 for the RGB uh, in terms of the brain score. And for the events stream is not 0.1851. So we will expect the uh, event streams to be to have a slightly higher brain score because of it's more biologically realism. Um, but that's not the case here. Um, so if we look at the brain score of the connect on its own on the and uh, on the image that data set, we will have we will expect a, a brain score of not point. Is that Mahani? Sorry, you have to so mute we, Terry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so we will expect the uh, brain score of the connect to be 0.431. So this is quite a bit lower than the what we expect. Um, so it, uh, this is probably due to the fact that the uh, images that we use is quite different from the natural images that's used in the image net. Um, so we need a bigger, more diverse data set uh, and simulation for the evaluation in the future. Here we go, project five. All right, uh, here is project five. And the target was inference and learning on Loihi in the hopes uh, to close the loop on the whole uh, uh, navigation system. Uh, the main um, goal was uh, to implement the entire V1 core net uh, on Loihi. And unfortunately, um, so there were some snags with uh, the uh, NRP side of things. Uh, so we only made some a little bit of progress uh, in this direction. 
and uh, the, um, the result was the implementation of the part of the women block in Nengo. It's still missing the stochasticity features. Um, this is uh, the block diagram of the implementation and uh, the way that we adapted the various parts of the V1 block uh, Gabor activations uh, generator. Um, basically, uh, the convolution uh, uh, with the Gabor filters were implemented through Nengo connections. We have a couple of pass-through nodes and uh, uh, one ReLU ensemble, uh, which uh, um, produces uh, the uh, simple channels part of the activations. And here on the right, you see the result uh, after applying these filters. Uh, in the middle, uh, there is the input from uh, the MNIST library. The, for, the first four channels uh, are uh, the so-called complex channels, which are produced by the, uh, by the neuron uh, ensemble. And the last four are the so-called complex channels, uh, which are just uh, um, combination of uh, uh, functions over the convoluted uh, um, image. Uh, looking forward to the eventual uh, Nengolo Wiki conversions, there are a couple of critical points. Uh, um, for example, uh, Nengolo Wiki only allows uh, pass-through nodes, so there will, will need to be changes uh, made uh, to this particular node here, which is computing a function. And also the ReLU ensemble needs to be converted to spiking logic and uh, therefore uh, some uh, parameter exploration needs to be done uh, on this side of things. So uh, the rest of the challenge to arrive for a uh, fully working V1 Cornet uh, implementation of Nengolo Iki is uh, adding the stochasticity features to the V1 block and uh, to implement the Cornet S or some other CNN which can exploit the V1 block. Uh, into the Nengolo Ihi, and of course uh, to study implementation over to the final platform. And uh, the final result, uh, hopefully, is uh, online learning on Loihi using Nengo. All right, I'll let uh, perhaps Bodo um, take the final words. Thank you. I think she will have some final words now for us. Uh, yeah. Do you want to put up that picture? Yeah, so, so one thing that's nice about Telluride is that when you develop something new that's cool, you bring it to Telluride because you get lots of customers, right? Lots of customers that will tell you um, what is missing from your implementation or from your hardware, your software. I remember Nengo came, what, how long ago now? 10 years ago, Terry? And then slowly over time, you know, you figure out what you need to add to it. And so in this topic area, we, we had a, like, I would say four new blocks, right? Um, that were brought into um, into the work and and even though I, I think um, it might look like not much was achieved, I think um, there's a lot of feedback in how we can make um, these different pieces better for next year when you integrate things together. So so I'm going to show the the picture of the people that left at the end. We call them the survivors, the ones that really went all the whole three weeks. And I, I thank them for their participation, also for Bodo for this uh, great organization of the top area. And thanks to all of you. Fantastic. Really great. Really great. Any questions to the SMI group? In the meantime, I'd like to announce that I want to take a picture of everybody's webcam or their, or their icon, if they prefer, who's left as a survivor of the final uh, review. So if everybody who's willing to have their photo taken live or be part of this picture, uh, please turn on your video. Uh, but in the meantime, is there any questions for the SMI group? I thought it was really lovely progress, by the way, an extremely difficult integration effort. Yeah, I thought that was no a really nice, really nice story there and uh, nice work from the group. And while we're on the topic, we should also say a huge thank you to Shichi, who served as the general chair uh, of the workshop. So uh, before we, yes, exactly. <laughs> really well done. It's not easy to organize uh, three weeks of virtual activities and you all, uh, I think, exceed your expectations. It was really uh, fantastic this year. So thank you for... And, and uh, MR too, right? And MR yeah. Yes, and MR as yeah. well. Okay, so uh, just a short interrupt. On the count of three, I'm going to snap this picture. So put on your best face. One, two, three. Okay. Um, let's see, is anybody blinking at that moment? No, it's really, it looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. I will share this picture on the Slack 
Uh, so you'll all have a memory of this, and thank you. And also I have I another question. I want to thank Toby for really being the fearless leader of all the technology. Being bossy. <laughs> being too bossy always. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Andres. No, it's yeah. cool. I have another question <laughs> okay. for the. Uh... Sorry. The, the I had another question for the last work group, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Go for it. I was wondering yeah. if this if this maze that you showed with the MNIST images and the, the neurorobotics, if that's available to do experiments somewhere. It is. Um, I think Sami and Michael, most of all, put together a nice GitHub repository with all the changes that has, have been made. And so we'll organize how we can make this available to people. Great. Um, I'll find some info on the Slack channel, I guess, then? Or... Yeah. Yeah, cool. I uh, will post. Uh, we'll summarize all the code results and uh, and post a link in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I thanks. Okay, so um, just before everybody goes, I can think of two things. Number one, I would like to meet with our, I think the topic areas would like to have a brief meeting after this one with our topic area participants, perhaps to, you know, have a drink with them or or say thanks or plan some future. That's number one. And number two, uh, next year, we're going to have a physical workshop. Elisabetta, I see you're there. Would you like to say something about uh, the possibility of funding for European participants from uh, Neurotech? Are you there still? Yes. Yes, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yeah. I wasn't prepared for this, but uh, in Europe, we have a so-called coordination and support action called Neurotech. And within Neurotech, we have fellowships for people to go to the States from Europe during Telluride, of course. So if you decide to apply, uh, there will be a, a box to tick where you say, I also want to apply for the fellowship at the time of applying for attending the workshop. And if you tick that box, your application will also go to the Neurotech uh, board that is going to look at this and then assign fellowships for traveling. And I cannot say at the moment the amount because we have to see, uh, we couldn't use money. So there is chance that we can, we can fund more people than it was planned because of skipping traveling for some time. So please do apply. Uh, we were able to give these fellowships only once so far and we would like to give them again. So be aware of this and, and tick the box if you're coming from Europe to Telluride. Okay. Where can we find the information? The information It'll be on the website be, next time. We'll be on the website next year, yeah. Thank it you. will be written explicitly okay. in the call for application and there will be more information also in the page where you're gonna fill the form to apply. And the deadline yes. for participant participation in the workshop actually uh, you know, basically the workshop pays for a large chunk of this exp very expensive housing in Telluride. Um, although you do have a registration fee, but that, you know, sometimes we have uh, fellowships to cover the registration as well for, for, uh, for some participants. But the application deadline, when is it usually? It's going to be around yeah. the end of the year. Yeah, no. to give everyone an idea of the timeline, typically um, new topics. Uh, proposals will be uh, there'll be a call for topic proposals around December and um, we will select um, them by uh, January or February and then at that point we open the talent the applications uh, for participation from to all and um, at that okay. point you'll be able to apply for the neurotech um, and other fellowships as well as we kind of develop some of those additional uh, scholarship opportunities over the next year. Also, uh, Cornelia, yeah. do you want to say something about our uh, grant that basically supports? Or, or you want? Yes, we also have uh, the the NSF support also gives three scholarships for Telluride participation. And in addition, the big thing uh, we will be starting by the end of the year announcing scholarships for exchange which will amount uh, for students or postdoc to visit other, be other researchers' labs for funding for half a year. And okay, that will be announced and through the channels. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Also, I, I guess if you guys register, you know, we have your mailing list. And so we can send out, you know, this information when the time gets closer also. And just to let you know that a lot of the presentations, I guess you're well aware, are on YouTube already. And the Slack space is going to stay up. So it's a space that you can keep talking and discussing and, co and collaborating um, until the next workshop when we open it yet another Slack workspace. Question for you, Toby. When you took your picture, did you capture all the people on one big screen or did you thumb through the different pages of people? Uh, there's only 50 people and I think that's that's the limit of what I could capture. All the people that are showing video basically were on the screen. Okay. Oh. It's uh, roughly, uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, it's how many across? Seven times seven. Yeah, so I got everybody. Who is a survivor? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we started with today. Did anybody notice? Maybe 90 or 80? About, yeah, about 80. Yeah, okay, not bad. <laughs> not so bad. That's yeah, okay. plus the, uh, the live stream online, which we sent out to all 650 people that were registered. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Toby, and also, I think you have a poll, right, that you were going to send out? Oh, uh, yeah, we have a poll just to get feedback on the workshop or we have to prepare it and we'll share it on Slack and, and by email. Um, I think on Slack probably because, well, on, by email, we'll share it by email for everybody who had any connection to the workshop. And so we just get some more feedback about uh, what worked, what didn't work, what you'd like to see. Suggestions are always welcome. And thank you. It's been, it's been really great. A lot of fun. Absolutely. Thanks. Everyone. So um, I guess that really closes the formal workshop and this Zoom meeting. And now I, I'm going to open a meeting for the LTC. And I guess you guys also will. And you can drop in on each other's topic area of meetings, you know, and put the maybe put the Zoom link on your on your channel or on the general announcements and people can drop in on each other and chat yeah. for a bit. S S S I, have my, I have my tequila, the last bottle left since the pandemic and I'm going to crack it open and have a drink. <laughs> Good for you. Don't, forget, don't forget the worm. <laughs> no, that, that's not tequila, man. <laughs> By the way, mezcal is really good, man. Really tasty. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank you. Congratulations, everyone. Okay. A fantastic workshop. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Bye. everyone. See you next year. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Uh, Terry, Jitsi now? Um, uh, in a half hour. In a half hour. Good. See you then.